The FDA recently approved a new drug, touching off a storm of news stories and inspiring hope for millions of Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. However, approval of the drug has led to an outcry among many experts. So what's going on? Are we on our way to an effective treatment for Alzheimer's? Or are we on our way to wasting time and money? That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. On June 7th, the FDA approved the drug Aduhelm for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Though data suggests the drug is effective at reducing plaques in the brain associated with Alzheimer's, it is unclear at the moment if this does anything to slow the actual progression of the disease. And it has some potentially serious side effects, meaning the harms could vastly outweigh the benefits. And the drug ain't cheap. Medicare, i.e. taxpayers, will bear the brunt of the very high cost in exchange for these questionable health outcomes. But for the FDA to have issued an approval, there had to have been some data, right? Well, we've got some, but it's conflicting. To the research, current data suggests that the drug does indeed lead to dose-related reductions in brain plaques, one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. But what that means for improvement of patient symptoms is much less clear right now. There were two major trials of the drug, and one reported a 22% relative reduction on a clinical rating of dementia compared to placebo, while the other reported no significant difference from the placebo group on the same rating. Normally, a mix of evidence like this would not warrant an approval from the FDA, even via the accelerated approval program, which was used in this case. In fact, 10 of the 11 members of the FDA's Peripheral and Central Nervous System Drugs Advisory Committee voted against the approval, with the 11th member voting as uncertain, and three experts have resigned from the panel in protest since the decision to approve. The Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, an independent think tank, also rated the current evidence as insufficient to claim a net benefit of the drug, and physicians have expressed hesitancy about prescribing it, citing cost and the risk of side effects such as small brain bleeds balanced with the questionable improvement for their patients. Full disclosure, I serve on the Midwest Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council for ICER. Well, let's back up for a second. You may be wondering, if the evidence suggests that those brain plaques are being reduced, why are we so unsure about whether it improves patient outcomes? One of the defining characteristics of a brain affected by Alzheimer's is large extracellular plaque deposits that contain small toxic peptides that we call amyloid beta. These build up in the Alzheimer-afflicted brain, especially in areas related to memory. However, controversy exists among neuroscientists as to whether these plaques cause the disease or are simply incidental to it. For example, it has been suggested that they are simply the body's attempt to isolate amyloid beta peptides because they are toxic to neurons, the MVPs of the brain. If that's the case, stopping these plaques from forming wouldn't do much to change clinical outcomes. So knowing the plaques are reduced is valuable information, but what we really need is definitive evidence for what that means in a clinical sense. Now to the money. According to the companies that created the drug, the average annual cost for maintenance dosing of a U.S. patient of average weight with mild dementia comes out to about $56,000 per year. And since lots of people with Alzheimer's disease are eligible for Medicare, that cost is likely to fall on taxpayers to the tune of billions of dollars per year. Nick Bagley and Rachel Sachs, both friends of the show, wrote a piece on this for The Atlantic. They point out that FDA approval and payment policies are tightly linked, meaning Medicare basically pays for approved treatments without concern for the clinical value offered. They also pay physicians 6% of the average price of certain drugs they prescribe, which can unfortunately serve as an incentive to prescribe higher priced drugs like this one, increasing the taxpayer burden even more. They also point out that Medicare beneficiaries won't remain unscathed either. This will fall under Medicare Part B, which requires patients to pay 20% of their care. This would be a little over $11,000 a year, an extra cost that will be tough for most people, but likely tougher on seniors. And though many seniors have supplemental plans for such costs, the price of those plans will probably increase now across the board, which is still tough on a fixed budget. And those under 65 who are in need of the drug may be eligible for Medicaid, in which cases states will have to cover much of the cost. Between these cases and cases where someone is eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, states will have to either raise taxes or cut expenses elsewhere to cover the extra cost. If we were sure of the drug's ability to improve patients' lives, these would still be difficult problems, but at least perhaps worth it. But at the moment, we're facing these problems for a drug that might not even help people. 
possible the restrictions we placed on Medicare's coverage of Agilehelm due to the lack of solid evidence that it's affected. This would definitely be a divergence from past practice, but that might be a good thing. As a condition of approval, the FDA is also requiring that a third trial be run. So approval may be withdrawn if that trial doesn't support good clinical outcomes. But that could take years, especially because it's hard to enroll patients in a trial when a drug is already available elsewhere. And there could be a lot of fallout in the meantime. In response to the outcry, the head of the FDA just called for a wide-ranging federal investigation into the approval. So we'll keep an eye on that as things progress. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on wives' tales about labor and delivery. We'd appreciate it if you'd like the video, subscribe to the channel down below, and think about going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show even during a global pandemic. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow and Joe Sevitz, and of course, our surgeon, Amaral Sam.